Hi, welcome to Obsolete, the show where old technology goes to live. I'm Famicoman, and uh, I've got a pretty exciting episode for you today. You probably noticed for the past couple of months that I haven't been really producing much content. I've been really busy with school, but as of today, I don't have any more finals or class for a couple of weeks, so I can definitely get some more content out. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go on to the first segment, which is CEDs Part 2. Now you may remember that I talked about CEDs. Well that was about six or seven months ago. Now I have a few more CED related items. For example I have some more advanced players, a couple of standard players, as well as a bunch of discs. Let's start with the standard players. This right here is an early Zenith player. You have a couple of cool things on the front. Uh, over here, there's an indicator for which side of the disc you're on, as well as the time. Then there's the rapid access buttons here for reverse and forward. These are similar to uh, skipping chapters on a DVD. You also have the visual search buttons where you can go reverse or forward. This is uh, like fast forward. You also have a pause button. And now here is your selector here. It's currently in the off position. And then we can go and load a disc and then flip it up to play a disc. Now if we look around back we can see that this is a model VP2000. And if we tilt it a bit we can see that there's a channel switch to choose between channel 4 and channel 3. There's an antenna input for your cable or your antenna and there's also a uh, out to TV so you can get this into your TV. So this is very similar to what VCRs are like. Something cool on the top of the unit is that it gives you access to the needle. You just undo this drawer, and you can see right here is the needle assembly. You can see a bit of the turntable down under there, too. And this is used if you need to replace the needle or do any sort of maintenance to it. Even if you didn't know what you're doing, the player comes with this cool manual. It shows you all about the features, accessories, how to replace the needle, the components of the system, and a bunch more information for wiring and stuff like that. So now that we know what we're dealing with, let me get this absurdly long cable and try to hook it up. So now that the CD player is hooked up to the TV, we can see that we currently have static on the screen. Let's try flipping the player to the load position. Now immediately you can see that the television screen has turned black. So now we need to choose a disc that we can use to test out the system. Let's see. Nah, not that one. Here's a couple that have been actually ruined by the player, so we don't want any of these. Guess we can give it a try with this one. So now that we're in the load position, I can just take my disc. And as you can see, the disc is no longer in the caddy. Now all I have to do is flip the switch over to play. And it starts to make a nice noise. Then we just look over at the screen. Now, unfortunately with this player, the uh, needle doesn't always align with the groove right away. So... I have to manually use the buttons on the front to move forward a bit before we can get any actual picture. And there we go, the video plays. Now as you can see there's a little bit of uh, distortion, it looks kind of like a scan line. That's caused by the fact that the belt is a little bit worn out and should probably be realigned or replaced. To then get the disc out of the player, I flip the switch down to load again. 
and that turns off the movie and then I get the caddy back push it in and then pull it out and the disc is back in the caddy so now that you've seen that player you probably want to look at my other players too so let's take a look at this early RCA model from the front you can already tell that it's pretty similar to the Zenith and I'd love to show this one off to you but there's one problem if you open the compartment on the top you see the usual needle assembly right but then if you go to open it it's empty someone took the needle out so I can't use this player so now you're probably asking yourself why don't you just use the needle from the first player or why don't you use it from any of the other players that you saw well here's the thing the problem with these players is that they all seem to use like a different type of needle so if you have one player you can't really switch out parts for another player unless they're very similar models and where am I gonna get you know replacement needles I have to find a whole other player in hope that this one has a working needle so what if I go on eBay and I buy another player and it doesn't have a needle in it either I mean you can't really win and where are you gonna find replacement needles it's not like you know there's a whole surplus of them out there that pop up on eBay all the time these things are basically unheard of okay so moving on to some of their later models here's an RCA SJT 100 now this looks pretty good I mean it's nice sleek design it's black and silver and I mean you still have all your basic functions you still have your visual search your rapid access pause play here's a reject button shouldn't it be like an eject button I don't know why they have the R in there and then there's the power button your side one and two are now with the little light over here and then where you are in the movie comes up on that little display now you want to know what the problem with this thing is it doesn't turn on I got this and I got another player and a whole bunch of discs at an estate sale and they said that everything worked and this player didn't work I mean you know I try hitting the power button nothing it just stays dead so right here we have the SJT200, which is a whole 100 up from the last player. Now, something about this player that's interesting is that it is the first stereo video disc player. So you can have all your video discs in stereo. Now the controls on the front look pretty similar, except there's a couple new buttons and a couple new displays. For example, on the left over here, you have the audio AB button. Now I'm not entirely sure what that's all about. Um, I guess if you're switching back and forth between audio, maybe there's like commentary on one part and there's a uh, regular audio on another part. That was common in a couple of the early laser discs where one channel would be standard audio and the other would be commentary. Now up here in this corner we also have audio indicators for if you have A audio, B audio, and then there's a stereo indicator. So I guess it can detect if your discs are stereo or if you want to choose between one of the tracks. So when we come around to the back, we see that we have the normal antenna in, antenna out, and the channel switch. But we also have something cool. We have RCA jacks. So now we have a video out, and we have left and right audio out. So now what this means is I can use one of these instead of one of these. So now I can get this sucker all hooked up to the television. So before I try putting a disc in or anything, let me just see what happens when I turn it on. Whoa, what's that weird noise? You know what? This is the other player that I bought when I got the SJT100. That's right, the same place sold me two broken Selectivision players. However, there is a good thing to come of this. I have another Selectivision player of the exact same model. So here's my other SJT200. Now you may recognize that I used an SJT200 in the intro to one of my previous videos showing that it didn't work. This was the actual player that I used and at the time it didn't work. This was actually the first Selectivision player that I bought and it wasn't until after I bought a couple more that I decided to open this one up and see if I could figure out what was wrong with it. I mean by this time I had a bunch that didn't work which means that I had some spare needles so I thought if this one didn't have a needle let me just try to pop in another one. Now it turns out that this player actually had six of these in it. Now as you can see this one is all scratched to hell and dirty. This one will never play again. It's also cracked in a couple of places. And there were somehow six of these jammed within the player. Including one of my own discs that I tried to get the player working with. So I simply removed all the discs and you know what? 
player works perfectly. I don't know how there was any problem with it before, but now it'll, it'll play any disc that you give it. Let's try it out. So now I decided to remove the top of the player so you can see what's going on. As I said before, this is one of the more later models, so it has a sort of automatic feature, so you don't have to toggle back and forth between load and play and all this other stuff. You can just push it a disc and it'll automatically go to work. So let's get our disc back here. Slide it in the front. You can see it pulls the disc in, takes out the caddy, and then pushes it out. Then it loads and goes right on the spinning. If you look up at the screen, it goes right to playing the movie. So now you might be asking how to get the disc out. Well, that's relatively simple. If we switch it over to reject, you can hear it spin down, and now it'll push up the disc. the disc goes back into the holder and now I can just take my caddy angle it right slide it in it'll take the caddy and then it'll push it back out light is green trap is clean so now that you've seen all my players and all my discs you might be asking is CEDs really worth it well when it comes to all the stuff that I have I mean it really didn't cost a whole lot of money if you think about it in the long run I mean, those two broken players, I also got a ton of discs with those, maybe 70 discs. And that whole total, the two players and the discs, was about 50 bucks. The, uh, the Zenith player that I showed, that was 30 bucks. That also came with about maybe 30 discs. And then the, uh, the working SJT200, that was, oh, I don't know, I think $13 on an online auction. And then the, the original RCA, the older one, I think that was about 10 bucks at auction. Now, some of the discs that I own, I actually got those for free just because nobody at an auction wanted them. So that's pretty cool. But the thing is, if you're going to go and start collecting CEDs or something, you should really know that what you're getting yourself into is a format that, you know, it's not even as known as Betamax. So you have very little support for this kind of stuff. I mean, if you don't have a needle, good luck trying to find another one. And, you know, if something doesn't work on your player, you really only have the option of either going online to eBay and buying one for a lot of money, or, you know, searching around until you find another player for you to get parts for. And then that player you get might not even have the parts you need. So this is really more of like a kind of a novelty sort of hobby. I don't really think much of this stuff is very collectible, but, I don't know, somebody out there might be selling these things for big bucks. But right now, it's just, you know, something to keep me occupied, something that's interesting. And, you know, it, it is really interesting if you think about it. You have video from a vinyl disc. I mean, who would have thought that that was possible? So, at the end, you know, you end up having a lot of broken players and a lot of broken stuff. But, you know, you can just put that towards parts, towards other players you might get, and eventually just throw out stuff that you don't even need. So, it's a pretty cool little thing that you could collect or, you know, accumulate if you want to say that, but um, really all the titles, I think all of them have been released on other formats, so it's really only a sort of a novelty thing. So I hope you guys like that segment, and if I get any more CED related stuff, I'll definitely be sure to share it with you. I hope you like that segment. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to go right into the next segment, which is Holiday Item Review. So it's the holiday season now, so I thought that I would do something a little bit different for my reviews, and I would review some stuff that you might be able to get for people, friends, relatives, around the holidays, depending on their interests. So to start out, I'm going to show you some books. Now, the first one is called From Betamax to Blockbuster, and this one is by Joshua Greenberg, and it's from the MIT Press, and it's a very interesting book about home video all the way from when it was released for you to buy for hundreds of dollars a tape you know to first being able to rent it and it just keeps going on about video rental and how video has changed basically the world so what's interesting about this book is that it has a lot of first-hand accounts some of it is given you know in a sort of researched format but there's a lot of quotes directly from people in the video industry as well as people who own stores and stuff like that 
It's really interesting if you're fascinated by old video technology. And you can get this for about 3 to $4 on Amazon. It's pretty cheap. It's, I mean, you know, you can take a gamble with it. Now, the second book I have is Phone Losers of America. Now, this is from PLA and uh, Brad Carter, who you might know as RBCP. And um, he actually signed it for me here. I got a pre-order. I think it was about $14, $15. And it's a really cool book. It's about 200 pages, maybe a little bit more, almost 300 pages. And it's actually a very quick read. Uh, most of the stuff in here can be found on the PLA website. Um, but although there, I'm pretty sure that there's also some sections that were here just for the book. There's a there's a lot of detail in here and it's very beautifully written so I highly recommend this one if you're interested in the world of phone freaking as well as a lot of there's a lot of comedic elements in it too which keeps it very entertaining and it's a really funny book and very inform informational as well. Now going on to some DVDs here this is Jason Scott's Get Lamp. Now you can already tell from the box that it's pretty cool. Let me open it up here. Now Start out, it costs forty dollars, and uh, this is from the same guy who did the BBS documentary. And if you ask me, that's that price is very much worth it for this. He puts a lot of effort into his documentaries, and they're very well done. This one comes with a collectible coin, so you can get a collectible coin with this. And then here's the inside box. I mean, if you just look at this art here, let me open this up. I mean, it's really beautiful what's done here. It's a two disc set. And it talks about text adventures all the way from, you know, the first computer text adventures to the choose your own adventure books. And basically how text adventures are responsible for all the video games that we have right now. And as in usual fashion with Jason Scott, if you've ever seen the BBS documentary, he gets interviews from people that are so deep in the industry that would probably be overlooked by anybody else trying to do this. He is very meticulous with choosing these people. And it's just an amazing documentary. I mean, just about every perspective is shown. And it's it's really great how he got so many people to share all of their points of view on the subject. Now, if you have like an IPTV lover, you can also go something like the Pure Ownage Season 1 DVD set as well as the CD. So you have the soundtrack and inside here, this is a four disc set. So it has the first season of Pure Ownage. Hopefully they'll continue up with the second season again. It's been delayed for a long time. And um, for the DVD set and the soundtrack, it's a total of $30. I mean, who doesn't love Pure Ownage? If you ask me, I think it's worth the money, even though you can get all the episodes online. I mean, you have tons of extras, you have commentary. It's just, it's a really cool thing. Now moving away from DVDs and books, you might have someone who's... I don't know, a little more electronically oriented. So something really cool that I found recently is liquid tape. Now you might think that this is kind of odd, but basically it's it's like a tape that you paint on. I'm guessing it's some sort of latex or vinyl or something. And this is great for when you have jobs that, you know, tape just, it, it's not going to hold up. Like if you're soldering something like two wires together and you're going to put tape on it, that gets really kind of gross after a while and starts to come undone. But with liquid tape, you just coat it on, and then it just stays there. It's like it's part of the cord. I actually use this to repair a pair of headphones that I have. And I really like these headphones, but shortly after I got them, I uh, stepped on the cord, and it came loose a little bit. Now, the wires inside are perfectly fine, but the cord came undone, so you could see the, the bare copper. So what I did is I took some of this liquid tape, and I, you know, went right over it, and it dried, and now it says good as new. So it's a different color, of course, but, you know... It looks pretty good. It comes in a bunch of colors, red, black, green, white. So you can get a color that you want. Now something else that it's interesting is wire glue. Now, if you can't find the soldering iron or you just don't want to have to deal with the soldering iron, you can get wire glue, which is just as it sounds, it glues wires together and it's conductive. So you just take wires as if you're gonna solder them and you put on a coat of wire glue. From what I've heard, you have to be pretty thick about it but it's pretty cool. Um, the liquid tape and the wire glue, they're both five bucks each, so you can take a gamble on those. It's pretty, you know, you, you'll definitely get some use out of them. Now we also have, here's a digital video stabilizer. 
Now, if you're anything like me, you usually try to get some of, you know, if you have old movies that aren't on DVD, or if you even have family movies, you want to convert them over to digital before the tapes eventually wear out. So this is a digital video stabilizer. You can see the back here has uh, RCA input outputs as well as a power source. I definitely recommend, you can get one with a connector for an AC adapter or one that you just open it up and you plug in a 9 volt. This one you can use either a battery or an AC adapter and I recommend that you get one with that. And um, these are pretty good for, they stabilize your tapes as well as remove any sort of copy protection. Now you might be asking, well, you know, if I have like a home movie or something, why would I need to get rid of copy protection? Well, the interesting thing about it is that like your input video cards are required by law to have some sort of, you know, copy prevention recognition software, I guess you could call it. So when you put in your old family tapes and they might be really shaky, the computer thinks that they're copy protected. So you know, that's kind of crazy. I mean, you can't even copy your own tapes, but using this little gizmo, you can strip all copy protection as well as stabilize the image so it comes in nice and crisp. Uh, these go for about, the lowest I've seen them is $25 on eBay. You can also get them from a couple of online electronics stores. And I'd say that they're definitely worth the money. They can be a little flaky at some times, but they always seem to come around. And they're a pretty good investment if you're ever trying to convert over any sort of old video. Now, from my previous episode, you might recognize the Stylophone. Now, the Stylophone is really cool if you have any sort of music fan or someone who likes synthesizers. And I mean, it's also just a really cool little device to carry around if you're bored. Maybe you have like 20 minutes before you have to go somewhere. You just bring out the Stylophone and you start doing crazy things with it. Uh, it costs about $20. You can get this on ThinkGeek. And it's, I'd say it's definitely a nifty little gizmo. I've definitely got my money's worth out of it. You can do, you can, you know, use the inputs and the outputs. You can bring in your MP3 player. You can output it to your headphones or your computer. Or just, you know, you can figure out your own uses for it. It's really cool. So, at the end of the review segment, I hope that I've helped you find something cool that you might be able to get sewn for the holidays. So now I'm going to take you quick up to the next segment which is the Commodore 1702. I hope you like it. Now you probably wouldn't know this, but when I'm recording using one camera or I'm using two cameras, I like to output all the video to separate monitors. Now you might ask why I do this. Well, when you consider your normal digital video camera, it has a very small screen. It's something like three or four inches. And if you have a camera like this, you don't even have a screen. All you have to do is you have to look through this and you know maybe you'll get the shot lined up right. But by having separate monitors, I can output each video camera to one of the monitors and that way I can see what I'm doing on nice big screens and if I have to I can easily make adjustments. Now the type of monitors that I use are the Commodore 1702. Now you might ask why are there Commodore monitors? Well if you think back when you had the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20 you'd hook those up to the TV but then after a while you know your parents were probably like well he's using the TV all the time for the computer I can't watch anything why don't we get him like some sort of separate TV or something to, you know, for him to do all this computing on? Well, that's where the 1702 came in. The 1702 came out in the 1980s, and it quickly established itself as a very good monitor. It had a number of knobs on the front. For example, you have tint, color, contrast, brightness, as well as horizontal position, vertical hold, and volume. Now if you look in the front, you can see that there's two RCA jacks here. You have video and you have mono audio. Now around back, you can see that you have a couple more inputs. You have your audio as well as your Commodore video, which consists of chroma and luma. I'll talk more about those in a bit. You also have a signal select switch that you can choose between the front inputs and the rear inputs. Now you might notice that the front of the second monitor seems a little doctored. It's actually a funny story how that all happened. I used to keep this monitor in my bedroom along with my 12 inch normal TV so that when friends came over they had their own designated place that they could hook up and play video games. Now one day what happened was that the monitor actually fell down face forward with the cable still in it which crushed them. And for some reason 
like the internal uh, PCB just snapped off. So what I had to do is I had to open up the monitor and solder directly onto the board in there and then I had some Cat5 sticking out. Now after that I went to Radio Shack and I got a couple of these. Now this simply unscrews and it is an RCA female adapter. So you can just take that and solder that directly in and then I now have control over my audio and video again. So now I'm coming to the back again. I'm going to show you a little demonstration of how to use these monitors using the best possible video quality through Chroma and Luma. Now you might be asking, what uses Chroma and Luma these days? I mean, everything has like RGB or HDMI. Some things still have composite. But what could possibly use Chroma and Luma? Now the answer to that might surprise you. Actually, you can use S-Video. Maybe you remember S-Video, a little four pin adapter. Now what's interesting about that is that those four pins, two of them are Chroma and Luma and the other two are ground. So what you can easily do is you can take an S-Video cable, cut it in half, take two RCA cables and cut them in half, and then solder them together so that you have S-Video on one side and your RCA cables on the other. So now, if you're still lucky, you might have a device that actually has S-Video out. This might include some, you know, higher quality VCRs, some older DVD players, as well as laser disc players. Maybe your computer might have an S-Video out on an old video card, or maybe your laptop will have S-Video out. So now I'm going to show you what happens when I try it with a laser disc player. So now that I have the Chroma and Luma cables hooked up to each monitor, I also have the S-Video ends into the laser disc player. This laser disc player happens to have two S-Videos out, so I can watch both monitors at the same time with the same image. Okay, so let's turn on each monitor. The one over here you have to do with the pencil because the button broke off. Now we're waiting for them to warm up. Now let me just go around and check the back. Both switches are set to rear. So now what we can do is we can load our laser disc. Saw the screen splash a little bit. Now they're both displaying stop. So I'm just going to put in a random disk. Now the disk is in, I can hit the play button. So the disk is now spinning up. And now we go right into the movie. So from the video camera, you probably can't tell the amount of quality that you're seeing. But the quality is actually very high when you compare it to any sort of standard TV, especially of the same size, as well as just composite video. Now something interesting about this type of television is that unlike your flat screens, you can use old video game light guns on these. So if you have something like, you know, the blaster from the Sega Dreamcast, you can use it on these TVs because the screens are round and not flat, like your modern televisions or your uh, old, like, Sony Trinitrons. So these are very high resolution, very clear, crisp monitors that you can still use today with all of your old video game stuff, your new stuff, and get a relatively decent picture. Hope you like this segment, and uh, I will be continuing to use these monitors as I film more. So if I think of anything else cool that I can do with them, maybe use them as an output for editing or something, then I'll definitely be sure to share it with you. That's it for this episode of Obsolete. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as always, I want to give some plugs out. Um, first off is to Dioth This, which is a new IPTV show. just came out last month, and it's uh, headed by Corrosion. So I definitely think you should check that out. I'd also like to give a plug to Electronic Beer, the podcast. It's uh, every Wednesday. 
and you can go visit the IRC at ThinStack IRC and you can listen in live and that's run by Cheese and Dark Sene and everybody and it's a really great podcast I definitely recommend that you should check it out um, as always I'd like to give some shout outs to the folks over at uh, Binary Revolution Forums as well as the Rant Media Forums for giving me uh, comments on the episode and giving me lots of tips and I'd also like to thank everybody who downloads the torrents and uh, keeps them seeding and I'd also like to plug some of my own stuff right now you can figure out uh, what I'm doing over at famacommand.com you can also visit the IPTV archive which uh, archives older video shows such as this one as well as a couple newer shows and you can also check out the command line blog which syndicates my blog and a bunch of other people's. I'd also like to give a shout out to Moonlit who constantly lets me use all of his songs. He designed the intro song. He recently redid his website and it looks fantastic. You can find all of his music there. I'd also like to give a shout out to Shinmarayu who's a great guy. Go visit uh, Logon at his website and uh, he currently syndicates me there. I also believe that there's a forum over there if you want to discuss the show. So that's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. You know how to reach the show at the email address in the IRC, and I'll see you guys next time. Credit card. Use my super dish. Okay. That's it. We're VIP members. Hey, I tell. All right. Okay. Now, how many girls you want? Uh, uh, twenty. Twenty girls. You sure? Yeah. Twenty, 20 girls, girls for right. me. Twenty for you. That makes forty. All right, forty girls. How many guys? Uh. To make it just 10. 10 guys, 40 girls. All right. What about a band? What about Freddie Fender? <laughs> Forget Freddie Fender. Get the Panther. We'll bring the food ourselves? Yep. Okay. Mark down a couple of kegs, though. A couple of kegs? Yeah. Sandwiches and stuff? That we'll have to pick up ourselves. Okay. Man, this is great. You're a genius. All right. You know what? First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to run out and buy myself a pair of glasses just like you. They won't help you. <laughs> All right, let's see now. I really envy you. Okay, we're part of the party's yeah. on, Bubba. We're ready now. All right. Wish I knew what it said. Well, if you learn how to read, maybe... It's great! Wow, that's it. They're notifying the members already. Another minute, there'll be beautiful girls. This, this is like looking at a book on TV. Yeah. Hey, 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 what's that? That's the light. Hey, I know that one. That says sex. No. There it is again. You're just putting that there so I can have something to read. The girl. Sex! I did it again. Sex! Set. Four times! It means set. The party's set. Sex! Yes. yes, you'll get plenty of sex. We got 50 members. We're all speed.